Hi, Wylan. Welcome to The Circle. Nice to be here with you and on a beautiful day in Southern California. It is absolutely a beautiful day. That's why we live here, right? Yeah, exactly. Pay all those monies. <laughs> yeah, I'll pay all those taxes. Actually, my tax guy kind of looked at how I was doing and said, you need to buy a place in Florida. Really? So I bought a place in the Florida Keys. And Seems it's like wonderful. a lot of people are getting to that advice these days. They are indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, seriously, I have no issue with paying taxes. It's just I don't want them to take everything. You know, I mean, I need a little left to be able to uh, buy some paint. Yeah, maybe some gas, some paint, yeah, something. some canvas, something. yeah, a little something. But <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, it was good. It was a good move. Well, there you go. Yeah, so I now live in Isle Morada and uh, do a lot of diving out there. I still live in Laguna Beach, as you know. And you've got galleries in Florida too. I right? got galleries everywhere in Hawaii. I also live Hawaii North Shore. Yeah. So um, it's a pretty good life. If you can get it. You know what? It's, wild it's always been good. You know, even when I was a starving artist, it was good. It was great. When you do what you love to do, you've reached the pinnacle of success in life. No I'd love to hear you is. say that from the outside looking in. It yeah. looks like that. It's no, like it's true. It looks like you've never taken a bad step or had a bad day. No, everybody does. But the thing is, uh, you, you got to learn from that. You know, you always learn more from your mistakes. Anybody will tell you that. But you just try to learn from it and move forward. And the best, uh, the success. To life and there's a lot of them is your attitude you got to have a good positive attitude you also have to treat people with respect and really good and i mean everyone from little kids all the way up to you know the grandparents and you know um i've always done that i never had to think what well, was i an asshole to this person or that person i've never done that yeah. i've always tried to be a good human being and i remember um you know i finished my book don't be a starving artist. And in the beginning, I said, you know, the key to success, I'm trying to tell artists how to be successful in the 21st century. It's really not that hard. It seriously is the greatest time in history to be an artist because people are, you know, interested in art or collecting. I love to hear that. But what I say in the book, in the beginning, the first step, you have to be a good human being, be a nice person. Yeah. You know, then you don't have to remember, you know, if you weren't. Yeah. Well, you've been a good human being and a very successful human being as well. I mean, Lucky. I've been a huge fan of yours for years. My whole family is. My mom, you know, we lived on Kauai. My mom was always about Wyland. I hear that a lot. My my grandma has your stuff. <laughs> I've been doing this while well, Wyland Galleries for 42 years. Wow. So in Laguna Beach is where I started my career. Absolutely. Um, right out in the canyon. I had a little studio gallery. I opened in 1978. Boy, where does time go, right? <laughs> but uh, it's Blink been a great eye. journey. I did the art festival. First year, I was artist of the year. The next year, they wanted to kill me because I was selling way too much art. <laughs> but I, I think I did that for like um, 13 years. Wow. Well, you've been yeah. around for a long time. And you're actually known as one of the most recognized and celebrated artists of our time. So that's kind of big. In addition that's to being great. a painter, you're a sculptor, writer, photographer, philanthropist, and filmmaker. Yep, and never had to get a real job. This is kind of a, a hobby that got out of control. Well, if you do what you love, you never work a day of your life, as that's they say. That's exactly. Right? No, no, it's been, uh, it's been a great journey. And I came out here the first time, um, 1971, little road trip with my mom, who was a single mother, Darlene. She raised four of us, four boys. And we did a little road trip from Detroit, where I grew up, to um, West Covina, where my Aunt Linda lived and my Aunt Terry. And I kept bugging them that, hey, you got to take me to the ocean because yeah. I'm an ocean person. I'm a water sign. Can't get you that close and not take you to yeah, the ocean. Yeah, I mean, Lake Michigan had waves and that was my ocean growing up, the Great Lakes. But here I, you know, was had the opportunity to see it for the first time after being inspired by people like Jacques Cousteau. And so uh, we went to Laguna Beach, right to Main Beach, and I ripped off my clothes and got down to my shorts and dove under a wave and I came up and these two gray whales were breaking the surface, spouted right in front of me. What it's like are looking the chances of that? It's like looking at dinosaurs, Must you know? March. Oh my God. So it, I can still remember, you know, these whales. When you see a whale, right, it changes your DNA. Yeah. I mean, you never forget it. Mm -hmm. And even today I get 
just as excited when I see one. But anyway, this thing like rolled its barnacle and crusted back and they used to migrate uh, right along shore here in Laguna. You know, and I, unfortunately all the boat traffic and everything has kind of pushed them out. But every once in a while you get a, a wayward whale coming in probably wants me to paint it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so then it fluked up and, and I went back to, uh, to Detroit where I grew up and I said, the ocean is my muse and that's what I'm gonna paint. And wow. I did. That's amazing. You've cool. been doing it ever since. Been doing it ever since. I was inspired by, like I said, Jacques Cousteau. I used to watch that every Sunday, the undersea world mm -hmm. of Jacques Cousteau. And I uh, was followed by the wonderful world of Disney. So those two icons, Walt Disney, and uh, Jacques Cousteau both had a lot of vision, both poets and artists and, you know, real visionary people kind of created who I became, which is kind of a hybrid of uh, artists and conservationists. Well, I can see both of the influences in, in the work that you do. I could see a little bit of both. So that's amazing. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in there, all kinds of influences, you know, when you're growing up. But I mean, it was important to have heroes and influences and music also influenced me, uh, Motown, obviously, but I always had music kind of in my soul. Detroit, we we have that. We have that rhythm, yeah. that natural. And it's a hard city. It's a good place to be from because, uh, you know, Detroit, we hustle harder. You know, I knew that I had to work hard uh, to be successful and I had no problem with it. You know, especially since my mom actually wanted me to get a job. She came to me at 16. She said, your brothers, you know, are all working in factories and they want you to get a job. And I said, I have a job. I'm an artist. And my mom went for this crap. <laughs> so she's glad now because she lives right on the beach down there. Okay. It paid off. I got your mom. Yeah. But it was pretty cool. And um, she did try to get me to do... Um, you know, a job and she dropped me off at the unemployment bureau in Detroit and I got fired the first day, got fired the second day. And then they called me in the office. They said, look, if you get fired three times at the Detroit Unemployment Bureau, you know, and it's $2 an hour, worst jobs in Detroit, like mm -hmm. day worker, mm -hmm. then this will be a permanent stain on your work, your, your work record and nobody will ever hire you and you'll be a loser. I mean, I'm 16 years oh, old, traumatic. Yeah. In fact, so embarrassed that I wouldn't even, um, you know, call my mom, come pick me up in the worst part of Detroit. I stayed in a little diner. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went across the street from the factory where I got fired again and again and again. And the waitress reminded me of Aretha Franklin, one of my true heroes. I loved her, still do. And... Uh, she kind of sensed that, you know, I was having a bad day. So she would give me coffee and a donut mm -hmm. and, and I would tell her my whole life story. I'm an artist. I can't, I can't work in Detroit in a factory. I, I want to go to California. I want to be this great artist. And, and she believed in me, you know. And so I have this vision for uh, a documentary film like, you know, Eminem, 8 Mile, kind of a rags to riches. But that's how it opens up. Basically, yeah. I get fired, I'm in the diner, and I start telling her the story, and then the story, you know, unfolds. I want to see it. I want to see that story. Absolutely. It's going to be a good one. Well, I've already I know wrote it's going to be in there. Yeah, I wrote the book called Wyland Water Signs. And, uh, yeah, it's already done in my head. I just have to show up and finish it. Wyland, you have done so much, but what you're probably best known for is the Whaling Wall Project. Right, Whaling Wall Project, yep. You completed well, 100 murals. 101. 101. I did one more in Seattle a year and a half ago with uh, Eddie Vedder, Pearl Jam. How cool is guy's that? Guy's pretty good with a spray gun, too. Who knew? Who knew the guy can handle a spray gun, but he's a friend of mine. And I said, I'm going to redo that mural on the iconic uh, Edgewater Hotel. Yep. You know, and I had a mural there of orcas, generic orcas, life size. But uh, a new owner of the hotel painted right over it. Mm. I get that once in a while. So anyway, um, the guy that worked at the hotel as the baggage guy was now general manager. And so um, it just so happens that the ship that I painted, Norwegian Bliss, uh, was parked right there. Um, at the Port of Seattle, right next to the hotel. So that's where they had a, a stay, you know, on the inaugural voyage to Alaska. 
So I'm in there. Guy sees me and goes, Wylan, oh my God, hey, do you think you'd repaint this mural for us? And I said, sure, next year. He goes, oh my God. So he got permission from the owner. And uh, in three days, I painted the, uh, the, the orcas, um, you know, in the San Juans, the J-Pod, life-size. Wow. And then Eddie lived right, right over across the bay. So he would come over by his boat, but he came every day, he actually dedicated the wall. And Eddie Vetter at the dedication says, you know, Wyland, he goes, great honor. This is like when I get invited to play with, you know, like the Rolling Stones and other artists. It's just like that, oh, you know, so coming cool. up on the scaffolding, you know, and painting with you. Mm -hmm. So that was like a high honor. Wow. So it's kind of cool when artists can kind of come together and collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. It creates something unique. Yeah. Well, yeah. and, you know, we just talked about that when Nick Hernandez was here. Yeah. And you guys collaborated. Nick um, I. We Nick did I. Uh, Blues Planet. We yeah. did all this music. Um on the anniversary of the Gulf oil spill. And I was so mad about it. I actually went out there on the fifth day, the worst day of the oil spill, the BP oil spill. And it was like 10 years ago. And I went out there and uh, I mean, it would make you cry. It was oil from horizon to horizon. And uh, so I was so mad that I went back to my home in the Keys and I kind of hunkered down for two months and wrote all this music for a documentary series I wanted to do about it called mm -hmm. Blues Planet, yeah. that the planet's got the blues. So I wrote, um, I wrote, um, how many songs I do? 70 songs, originals. Seven zero? Every, seven zero. Oh, wow. In two months. You're I wrote, very prolific. Well, I, I'm not really a musician. I am, but I'm terrible compared to these other guys I know. But anyway, when I'm, you know, writing the lyrics, I'm painting them. I'm painting the words, mm. and then I can hear the music too at the same moment, and I can hear who I want to play on the record. But the music was for the documentary, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever I do, I kind of I overdo everything. Okay. So if I needed, let's say, one record, sixteen songs, I might do three times that, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what we did. So we recorded forty-eight songs, originals, blues, every kind of style you could imagine with 38 of the greatest blues artists in the world, including Taj Mahal, um, Marcellus, uh, Steve Ture, Rod Piazza, you know, the mm -hmm. Mighty Flyers. And then I brought in people like Nick Guy. And everybody's going like, who the heck is Nick Guy? <laughs> and I said, I'm the producer. This is Wyland Records. You're going to find out who he is. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they said he's the most valuable player. Wow. And he was. He worked really hard. Nick did a great job. And uh, together we garage band, um, I think 22 songs he co-wrote. That's incredible. Oh, he's a monster, yeah. you know, talent. And he's from Laguna too. Yep. So uh, Nick I really brought it. And then I brought in Willie Kay, Uncle Willie Kay from Hawaii, legend. And uh, Amy Gilliam, mm -hmm. who's been nominated for Grammys, but never won. She should have on this song called, uh, you know, um, let's see what's the name of that one. It's the second song in the film. Anyway, she's so great. And uh, every one of those songs had a different edge to it. And uh, the horn section, I mean, we had 12 people in the horn section alone. And then what I would do is come out and just sit on the couch and bring all these great musicians in and uh, watch them take the music that I created to this, to this, to this. And uh, a lot of the songs, one take. Wow. You know, and I remember too that... Uh, I wanted to do the album cover as a earth with a little teardrop in the eye, like mm -hmm. a smiley face mm -hmm. earth. So I had this concept. So we all did a second line march. And in New Orleans, that's uh, whenever there's a funeral or a celebration, the bands will start coming together and they'll march and everybody in the community will come together. So I did that with our band, our 38 players and you know, Taj Mahal had his uh, banjo and Nick and all of us, and we marched out to this graffiti area, and I tagged this wall. Well, I would have got arrested, except they thought it was Treme. They thought we were doing, like, <laughs> you know, HBO, because there were so many people watching. Yeah. And I had, like, seven cameras rolling yeah. on every song for the, for the film. So uh, it was really cool. So I painted this graffiti, this giant, you know, earth with a non-smiling face and a tear. And then the band all marched out to Louis Armstrong's 
it's a wonderful world. Oh my gosh. Goosebumps. Yeah. But, you know, again, that's all going with the flow too. Like, you know, this could have been really crap, but I knew when I brought these musicians in, and by the way, all of us went to the last weekend of Jazz Fest uh, to take in the blues, the folk music, the, everything, every style. Okay, so we came out of there really charged up. And on the anniversary of the oil spill, we started recording. And the other thing is, I knew the guy that owned the, 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 you know, the place, the beignets, the famous place in New Orleans. So he said, can I come and watch these guys record? You got every legend, Dr. Michael White. I said, yeah, if you bring beignets in the morning, and he did. <laughs> so he brought that and coffee, and the guys came right in there on time. Uh, great. And uh, Nick wanted to do a reggae blues uh, song uh, that I wrote called All Gone. And so uh, it was the last one we recorded. And it literally made Taj Mahal tear up. Mm -hmm. It was that powerful. Oh, and uh, there's nothing like it. But, you know, in the middle of the song, you know, I'm looking at the lyrics. I'm listening. We're recording everything. And all of a sudden, he goes off script. He starts freestyling. And I'm going, what? I didn't, didn't write this. And it was epic. It made the song. And that's, yeah. that's the genius of, you know, Nick I and these other musicians, yeah. you know. And I, my style of being a producer, you know, whatever, um, is to bring in the right talent and then put those voices together and give them the keys to the car, let them drive. And man, did they drive. Yeah. So it made a beautiful... Uh, recording three records, uh, Blues Planet, one, two, and three. And we also um, made a beautiful film that won uh, the um, Blue Ocean Film Festival, was the winner, and uh, epic. And I still have two more to make. Wow. So we got a lot of material well, speaking done. Speaking of collaboration, you got Greg McGilvery right there in Laguna, too. Well, Greg's an icon. I mean, yeah. he's amazing. I, I love Greg McGilvery. He's been making films, the best films, the best IMAX. He's him and Barbara, his son, that whole team down there, yeah. they're impressive. They sure are. Well, now you you bring it up, oil spills. We just experienced yeah. another one right here off the coast of California. Yeah. Where where were you at when, when that hit? Were you here? Uh, no, I was in Florida. And Taj told me, he said, I wrote this song called, uh, it's a song about the oil spill. And, and uh, he said, look, uh, this song is gonna regenerate and be more popular every time there's an oil spill, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wrote about my experience uh, going out into the oil spill. The motor broke down, we had to be towed in, our eyes were burning. So I wrote that song and um, it's called Dirty Oil and Taj Mahal uh, sings on it and the other players, uh, very powerful song. Yeah. Kind of opens up Blues Planet sounds, which is the music driving the message of conservation yep. from the very first uh, Earth Day, you know, and um, anyway, it was pretty cool. So I wrote and produced, directed that. Um, well, the Wyland Foundation has been a big player in the conservation preservation aspect, and yep. uh, nobody feels it more than we do here in California, because obviously our environment has played such a huge role in where our states, the problems that our states have been having. So seeing this happen, I mean, what what are your thoughts? You've been- uh, Well, you, you cry, man. You just think how stupid are people that they think that they can continue to do something that uh, has the potential to destroy the health of the planet. Do you think we're gonna finally ocean, see an end to offshore drilling? Well, I think we have to, but uh, people really gotta, you know, you gotta step up. And you, you got to let your voice be heard. Uh, you know, I do it through my art and through music, but I think people want a, a, a healthy ocean and a mm -hmm. clean environment. It's just, uh, we got to be together on it. You know, yeah. the government's not going to do it. Everybody goes, oh, they got, no, they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's up to us, each and every one of us to, to do our part, to just stand together and say no. You do a lot of work with kids. Do you feel like we're doing a good job at teaching this next generation about the need for conservation and the issues that Well, what's that funny is um, 
that's been my focus with the Wyland Foundation. And by the way, we're celebrating uh, 28 years of art, conservation, and community. Congratulations. Sunday. Yeah. Woo-hoo. In Laguna Beach. So I'm um, really proud of that. But um, our focus from day one was how do we get the kids uh, involved and, and inspire action through our youth? And so... You know, every time I did a whaling wall project, 101 of them, I invited the community to bring all the kids out. And, uh, you know, sometimes we had 10 kids and sometimes we had um, 50,000 kids wow. at once, 200 schools at a time. And I think that was probably the most important part, part of uh, what I do mm-hmm. is passing on my knowledge and inspiration about protecting the health of the planet to our to our young people. Because... If you're ever going to make an investment, that's where you have to make it. Yeah. You know, if you plant that into the hearts and minds of our our, our kids, uh, it, it grows fruit. A lot of these kids have gotten back to me 20, 30, 40 years later and said, hey, you inspired me to be a conservationist. You inspired me to be a marine biologist. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. You know, and I, this generation, I don't believe, will stand by and allow uh, the big oil companies and you know, the polluters, um, you know, I, I see it positively though, because the kids know more than I ever did. Mm-hmm. And they're passionate about, uh, you know, being creative thinkers for some of these problems. And the other issue to Wyland Foundation has always been focused on from day one is art education in America. And uh, you're seeing art and music disappear from our schools. And I'm writing a book about it now called Saving Art Education in America. And it's pretty hard hitting. But the bottom line is, who thinks it's okay to take art and music away from our kids? You know, I mean, you're handicapping them. The whole world understands and appreciates how art inspires creative thinkers. Yeah. You know, if I didn't have art, I wouldn't have done anything. Um, I read a story about Steve Jobs. And he said, and this will be in the book, he said that if, he said, my art education was more important than science and math. Wow. But look at Apple. Look at what he created. Mm-hmm. It's art. It is creative. It's art. Yeah. So, you know, and it may very well be an artist that creates the, the next innovation to ensure we have clean air, water, you know, our beautiful lands, our environment. So we need to keep that alive, and uh, I'm going to take a very strong stance, uh, and we all should, to ensure that art education, you know, stem the steam. And so I'm going to be on the front line. That's the beauty of saying having a little bit of influence is uh, I can actually call somebody and say, look, let's let's work together. Let's get this done for our kids, you know. Well, and I know people listen when you you talk because— I don't know if you remember this, but that's where I originally met you was at a, um, it was a public service uh, program that the Orange County Department of Education put on. And I know you've been very active in a lot of the school work and making appearances. And um, you had your mobile learning center. Yeah, that that mobile learning experience with the theater. Yes. And it's really cool because the kids enter it as a drop of water and they go through the whole water cycle. And it's a real creative way to kind of engage people because, yeah. you know, the same old, same old is boring. You know, I remember we used to go on field trips to museums and mm-hmm. things like that. So um, a lot of these kids that live near the ocean never see it. They haven't seen it. So we bring the ocean to all 50 states, mm-hmm. Canada. We did a big program in Mexico uh, for six weeks. But um, when you plant those seeds of conservation through art and science, in the hearts and minds of a, a generation, man, that's the investment that sure. I wanted to make. And Absolutely. the Wyland Foundation and our partners all kind of chipped in to make that happen and continue to do it now. That's I mean, we put creating a legacy. I think we put nearly two million people through that experience. Really? Yeah, and it's free. I mean, it's free uh, to underserved communities. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we try to get it sponsored a little and Mm -hmm. really appreciate people that support the Wyland Foundation. But we're 28 years in now, and um, it's kind of my legacy. It's our legacy together. absolutely. Yeah. Do you have children? Not that I know about. (laughs) But the day's still young. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> what time is it? <laughs> no. Um, no, I've been pretty careful. Um, I would be a good dad, but I'm never home. I mean, I'd be a good one, I'd be a bad one because uh, I've been married to my art. And it uh, sounds kind of like, oh yeah. But listen, if you want to kind of achieve what, what I have, it takes 24-7. I can imagine. I mean, you know, my whole life. So I've been painting since I was four years old. So I'm 65. I've been painting for 60 years, mm -hmm. making art, making sculpture, making music, films. Um, it, it took everything I had to, to make that happen. Yeah. And I enjoyed every second of it. But I really didn't have a time, you know, for a lot of other stuff. I mean, I have a cool pet. I have a desert tortoise. I've had a pot belly pig. I had two Jack Russells that Joan Irvine gave me. Um, but I've never been married. I'm single. Single ladies. <laughs> Did I just say that? With your That's blue so eyes? Funny. Right. No, um, I don't know. Well, I, when you look back at all of that, though, because, I mean, really going through your uh, bio for this interview, I was, I mean, I was pretty blown away. I mean, when you look back at that yeah, body of work, what lot. really stands out to you? What are you, what are you most proud of? Every day, get up and be creative and try to be an innovator. And then I also try to put light on people, you know, not just artists, but everyone I can. Everyone I ever meet, I try to, you know, give them a smile, put a little light on them, give them a little advice if they want it, mm -hmm. you know. And um, success is really about hard work because in America, everybody has an opportunity to be successful. Mm -hmm. But it ain't about the government giving it to you. You have to go get it. Yeah. You know, I remember somebody said, oh, you're successful because of the government. No, the government's successful because of us, hardworking people. Yeah. You know, absolutely. your team here, my team working right now, us. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd call what I do work, but it is. It I mean, is I, work. Yeah. When you're an artist, um, it's 24-7 it's in your head. You're always, you know, a creative soul. You're always working. So... It is, I guess you would call it work. I'd call it uh, fun. Yeah. But you bring up a good point because there is kind of this stigma that you see in creative communities where um, as soon as somebody becomes commercially or financially successful, right. they're kind of pegged as like a sellout. And it's the opposite. So I said this, um, I was on CBS with Tracy Smith, you know, second time with her. She does a beautiful job Sunday morning, CBS. It's a national show. And she asked me, she said, some of these art critics don't like you. I said, good, because I don't paint for the art critics. I paint for the people. Yeah. Art critics. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. Yeah. I wouldn't waste one second on that. What do I care? Art critic. You know what? Come on over. I'm going to give you some canvas and paint. Let's see what you can make. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah so I just, true. I'm not big on critics. Yeah, never have been. Uh, I think they're a joke. You know, and uh, well, you know, the it proof seems is in the pudding. You've obviously your your work has been sold worldwide. Yeah, You're sold in zoos, museums. I mean, I know those had... critics hate guys like us. You know, I was talking to Robert Bateman about it. He's the number one wildlife and artist in the world. I guess he just turned ninety one. Hey, Robert, love the guy. He wrote the forward to my very first book, and it sold one point four million copies. Thanks again, Robert. <laughs> so anyway, for a coffee table book, yeah. unheard of. So anyway, we we were talking about, you know, we'll probably never be in an art museum till we're dead because they hate guys like us. You know, he's one of the most successful artists in the world, in Canada, for sure. And uh, anyway, he dedicated my 13th mural, but we had a good laugh about art critics. We're not big on it. But so now he has his own... Um, museum, art museum, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, in Victoria. And he, he's one of my favorite guys, too. Man. He's just so down to earth. He's so smart, but just the best wildlife artist in history. Mm -hmm. But he also thinks I'm pretty cool, too. We did a thing with PBS about me being the Olympic artist, and I was there for the Winter Olympics in, uh, in uh, Vancouver, and he came in, and we we're doing a thing on the BBC. So, go, so they're interviewing both of us together, and so they say, uh, Mr. Bateman, what do you think of Wyland? He goes, you know, this young artist. And he goes, oh, he scares me to death. <laughs> he goes, I love his art. And I go, 
I need a copy of that. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. So what does that mean to be the Olympic artist? Well, uh, it used to be Leroy Neiman. So if you guys are watching, remember the guy with the cool mustache? Mm -hmm. You know, and I saw him the first time in Mexico City as the official artist for the Olympics worldwide. Now they have it by country. So I'm the U.S. Olympic artist officially. Sometimes they have more than one. But um, anyway, it means a lot because you get to use your art to further the U.S. Olympic team. Like I just did, painted some surfboards for the U.S. Olympic surf team. Oh, that's cool. And Carissa Moore won the gold medal, of course, and six-time world champion. We uh, we actually kind of launched this thing called um, Surfers for Conservation, wow. even before she won that gold medal. So... But we're going to do that with surfers around the world. And uh, but anyway, to support uh, you know our U.S. Olympic team means everything. They don't get any support from the um, government, which is unheard of. Every other government supports their Olympic teams. Bizarre. We don't. We give money to everything, but that. Well, maybe it's because the things we, have we should give it to. Sponsors, huh? Is that a hummingbird? That's beautiful. Look at this. <laughs> Lots of them out there. It's my little Where's hummingbird. My Wait, I'll do it visually. <laughs> All right, I'm painting that when I get home. Birds too? Look at that. That's cute with the bird of paradise. Oh. That's awesome. Yay. Sorry, guys. You are, you are a creative, huh? You just find creativity in everything you look Absolutely. at. Absolutely. There's beauty everywhere. You just got to seek it out. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, what, it was funny because I was going through it. So uh, Norwegian Cruise Line. Yep. Uh, commemorative stamps. Right. Uh for the United Nations, yeah. License plates. I loved the California license plate. Quick story never... on that. So they came to me many years ago and said, we want you to do a personal license plate. Going to raise money for the uh, ocean and the coast and Wyland Foundation. Sounds good. So I designed the, you know, the whale It's like your whale hat. Tail. It's the whale tail. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's classic. Sold over 50 million. Now I think it's 100 million. Really? The, the biggest selling license plate, personal license plate in the history of the world. Wow. So, but they weren't given the Wyland Foundation anything. Finally, they gave us 20,000 and they had like 50 million. Are you kidding? And I'm going, so I contact them and I said, excuse me, you know, you're supposed to be supporting us. The guy says, the head guy, Peter, we don't have to give you anything. I said, really? Then you can't use my art. He goes, you said we could. I said, well, now you can't. Unless, going forward, you give the Wyland Foundation 20%, and you can keep 80, and you can keep the 50 million. Yeah. Well, we'll think about it. So I go to Norway to give a lecture at the International Children's Conference. The children always pick who they want to be the keynoter, and it was me. Oh, how cool is that? And it was just before I went to China. So I had all the kids from all the countries come out and paint the first mural of the Hands Across the Oceans that I did uh, for the Beijing Olympics. My phone starts blowing up. And the Coastal Commission actually, um, they had this writer, I think for the AP, leak this story. Oh, violence, you know, greedy, and he's... He's uh, demanding, you know, money, you know. And uh, first of all, I never took a penny, never wanted one. It's to help the foundation with parallel programs for, you know, they're protecting the California coast. Wyland Foundation's protecting every drop of water, fresh water and salt water around the world. So I said, we need funding too. So I got in a big to-do with them, but they already got that first in. So anyway, it was it was horrible. You never think that somebody, an organization like that would stab you in the back. Right. But I'm not afraid of these people. So I wow. took them on, but it was too late. They got that in. So all this propaganda, their attorney said, we're going to have another artist copy Wyland's whale tail plate for California, and we're not going to give the artist anything. I mean, just, and then artists were even like coming after me. You know how people are. Yeah. Oh, you're a greedy artist, you know, and you're demanding. I'm demanding some money to support with no, from my art yeah. to support my nonprofit Wyland Foundation. And then once we explained it, they're going, oh, we didn't hear that part. Yeah. So once everybody heard the whole story and we had a press conference in Laguna and I had the original painting there, Tales of Great Whales, and I have the 
plate still today on my car. And I, I told him the whole story. I said, this is all propaganda. And, um, you know, I'm not going to let it stand. So they still continue to sell that plate. I mean, they don't sell it, but you can renew it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was that was one I should have got in front of a little yeah. quicker. I'm sorry. That I usually don't lose thing, those, but, but I could have won, but I didn't want to. I just said, I'm going to move forward. Never look backwards yeah. anyway. You always yeah. want to be a forward-looking person. I love But that. I learned a lot from that. I can imagine. Mm-hmm. And I have a license plate in uh, Florida, a whale tail, a different yeah. one. And oh, it does great. Cool. Oh. But nothing like that one. That was like um, lightning in a bottle. Well, that was that like Jack right. Johnson. Remember he came out and just blew up the whole world? <laughs> well, and couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Yeah. He's my neighbor. He's like, I am very conservation-minded. He uses his music and, you know, his conservation and... Sometimes we work together on things, but I, I admire him and yeah. Kim, his wife, his organization, what they do. Very cool. You hang out with all the cool cats. Yes. Why not? Yeah. If you're wildin', why wouldn't you, right? Well, like-minded people should hang out together. There you go. I you know? agree. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Like Nick I and I hang out together. You know, we're two, uh, two pirates probably. Mm. And we're related. That's an really? inside joke. Oh, okay. Nick, I was about to say. We're related. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make them fall over. Okay. Okay. So we're not we, we, you do any have to, on that we do one. have to talk about mm-hmm. a little something because sure. this is another thing I didn't know about. Apparently, you are in the Guinness Book and world you hold records, the world yeah. record. Two of the, them. Well, you broke your own record, right? I did. I you did. broke your own record. So, two, two world records yep. uh, for painting the most. Largest mural in, in the history of the world. The largest was Long Beach. Then I made a bigger one. And then I also paint in Destin, Florida. Um, but I also did, uh, I painted the largest uh, American flag in history, four acres on top of the, the largest mural in the world. Oh my gosh. So, wow. Yeah. Where's that? Destin, Florida. Oh my gosh. Eglin Air Force Base fly right over this thing. So I wanted to give a salute to our troops. I'm, I'm big on our military and That's very cool. you know, police and first responders, firemen. True, absolute true heroes. And it's just crazy to see all the nutty stuff going on yeah. with that. I mean, well, these are the people that will save your Happy life. Veterans Day to all our veterans Happy out Veterans there. Day. My dad was a uh, Navy, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, hey, there's bad apples in every industry. Yeah. Including yours. Yeah. Including artists, I'm sure. But most people are good people. Mm-hmm. And that's that's who I want to be with. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, somebody, I think I read this thing that said, uh, I'm with everyone who's not an asshole. Sorry. <laughs> but true. I'm right? with everyone that's not an asshole. There you go. If you're a nice person, come in. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's have some fun. Yeah. But if you're not. Bye-bye. See ya. Am I allowed to say that? You are. I guess Absolutely. I just did. You just did. Bam. There you Ooh, go. That's at Detroit. Still got that good. I think a lot of people think that way too. Yeah, good. Right? Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to, sometimes you got to stand up and say it. All right. So big questions is to learn a little bit more about the man behind the whale tail. Do you have any consistent (laughs) days? That's why. You lived in my hometown, yet I never saw you. Uh Right. Do you have any consistent daily routines? Uh, Let's see. Yeah, I get up. <laughs> I get up every and have day? coffee every day. Wow, yeah, I actually get out of bed every day. Okay. Um, You're not one of those guys that you meditate or walk the beach every morning? No, I do get do in the ocean every day. I got to be in the water in some Every form, day. Either the pool or the ocean. Yeah, I live in Hawaii right on uh, the North Shore, so I'm in the water there in Cabela Bay every day, in Laguna every day. Mm-hmm. Um, very blessed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm very grateful. All my places are right on the ocean. My what, place is the, in what do you think the water does for you? Water, uh, it, it really transforms your DNA. Mm-hmm. It makes everything perfect. So you, if you're in the water, it, I'm a water scientist, so I know a little bit about this, but water uh, restructures your DNA. Mm. It's so healthy. Fresh water and salt water. It has been like that for me my whole life. I'm more comfortable in and under the water than I am on land. 
-hmm. you know? And if you think about it, we came from the ocean. Mm -hmm. All life did. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very natural. But, you know, when you're on the beach, even near the water, I mean, it just recharges you. Mm -hmm. And you need that if you're working hard or, you know, all this stressful, crazy things that are going on. I tell people, immerse yourself in, in the water. You know, we're the water planet. It's so true. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's nothing like being in the water, in the ocean, surfing, diving, uh, just taking it in, swimming, okay, just so floating then. around there like a beached whale. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I go my whole life trying not to look like a beached whale. No, FYI. I know. I'm going to do a sit-up next year. <laughs> Got this rigorous program. Uh, Dana White would be proud, you know. Okay, so the fact that Wyden likes to be near and by and in the ocean is not that surprising. Tell me something right. that people would be surprised to hear about you. I'm a biker. Really? I've been riding motorcycles since I was 15. My next-door neighbor, Roger, my best friend, uh, his brother went to the pokey, so he had a nice 500 cow, Kawasaki. And, uh, yeah, I used to ride that, and I've had motorcycles my whole life and love them. What's your motorcycle of choice these days? Um, I had an Indian Chief, um, plenty of Harley Davidsons. I yeah. got on the back of a bike this year for the first time, the first and I really time? liked it. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you know, it's the freedom of the road, you know, and... Here you have to wear a helmet, but in Hawaii and Florida, I mean, I, I advise you to wear a helmet, but I've been driving, like riding motorcycles my whole life. I'm considered an organ donor, the ones that don't. Oh my gosh. Is that bad? That That's bad. Yeah. We yeah. like helmets. Put your helmet on. Put your helmet on. But if you see me without one, don't be a hater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, I love, I love my motorcycles. And love Harley Davidson. Got the tour to plant in Milwaukee, and uh, wherever I went doing a wall, they kind of did a little research that I'm a biker, and they would always bring me some motorcycles. And oh, that's cool. I remember New Zealand. I was painting a wall in Auckland with Sir Peter Blake. Uh, and uh, anyway, these real hardcore bikers like brought me a couple of bikes for me and Roy Chavez, my main painter, and and uh, it was raining. It was like. It was like all these curvy roads and dangerous. Yeah. And they wanted to see if an artist could ride a motorcycle. So I just basically flew up to the front and they bought us drinks the whole time because we can. Yay. But they think thinking some wimpy artist can't ride a motorcycle. It's like, <laughs> really? I guess you showed them. Yeah. Tell me about a book or person that had an influence on you. Uh, let's see. Well, Salvador Dali was my favorite artist as a kid. And I, I didn't like Picasso in the beginning, but I, I grew to appreciate Pablo Picasso. I've and, got a couple uh, dollies. That's one right behind your head. I know. I love Dali. I got some Dali. I love them. Mm -hmm. I tried to buy an original at his museum in uh, Cataquest. And um, Did they let they're you? considered national treasures. You're not really allowed to. Mm. But I wanted one anyway, so... I didn't get it. Okay, relax. <laughs> they said, you're going to have to take it out of the frame, roll it up, put it in a tube, oh. and call it a poster and act stupid. Oh. I'm good at that. Okay. But well, uh, no, I didn't do it, but the thought was good. Who other? Who, who else's art do you collect? Um, I can trade with anybody. Really? Yeah, I have a great art collection. Wow. Yeah. And you keep it in your private residences? My or? three places, yeah. and then I have some... Um, I have a building I bought for the Wyland Foundation. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a major art collection. And I also have a children's art collection that I've collected from children all over the world. Interesting. And my goal eventually is to create a, a Wyland Art and Science Museum. And uh, I was going to do it in San Diego, but I decided to do it in South Florida. What would that encompass? Okay, so... I want you to think as big as you can because we only live once. I always have to think big when I'm thinking about you. I swear to gosh, uh, there's no such, you don't do anything small. Well, when I, thank you. When I was in Beijing the first time and saw the bird's nest, the architecture of that stadium, I literally told the guy, pull over. I had to take it in. And I thought, if I ever do an art museum, I want it on that scale where you literally lose your breath looking at it. 
So I started thinking about Gary and some of these great architects that I could collaborate with. And I said, the greatest architect is nature. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I went around and collected shells. So I got this Nautilus shell that I'm going to scale up to like 25 stories. And all the chambers will be different chambers for my various periods of my art over the years. And, uh, you know, my best pieces and sculptures. Mm -hmm. And then now uh, there's going to be a uh, starfish, but, you know, bigger than a football field. And then the, the chambers for the children's art from, you know, pre-kindergarten all the way through college level. The permanent exhibit. And then I have, uh, I do a Wyland uh, National Art Challenge every year contest. And so the winners will be presented in the museum. We'll put some light on them. And uh, where are we going to put this? Going to do an, um, a sea urchin. It's going to be the IMAX theater. And uh, Greg, right? So uh, probably Florida City, mm. uh, the gateway to the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. I already got um, Ron DeSantis. I got his uh, chief of staff, kind of liking the idea. Okay. So you know, um, I could do it in San Diego. I love San Diego, but the politics are crazy, mm. and I don't want any politics. Yeah. I want to be able to say, look, I want to, I have this vision for this art museum. It's going to be great for the state, for the world, because we'll do all our Wyland Foundation programs. But I, I don't want anybody second guessing me, oh, well, that's a little too high or you don't have the this for that. And no. If an artist like Walt Disney has a vision, then you let them have their vision. You let them do it. You know, like Dolly built his museum in, in, in Cataquest, Spain, and I've been there many times, and it's Dolly. It isn't some politician. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna be looking out for that, man. Yeah, it's ten years away, but uh, I'm excited about it. Actually, I have to sell a few more paintings to finance it. But you guys listening, collect art. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be some corporations that might want to help you with that. Oh, absolutely not. I've, I'm. I'm having the best success I've ever had. Every year, it's amazing. It just keeps getting better, you know, when you build a brand. Yeah. And, you know, when I grew up, I didn't know what a brand was, but talk about it in my book for artists, um, that uh, everything you do in life, it, it, you know, you're a brand. It's not just Coca-Cola or Disney. You're a brand. You're a brand. Mm -hmm. So whatever you do either supports your brand or diminishes it. Mm -hmm. So all of us are a brand. Once you back up and look at it that way, you go, wow, maybe I should be doing this or that. But, um, and again, the critics, oh, he thinks he's a brand or he's, you know, commercial or, you know what, they've got it completely backwards. Let me tell you how it should be. If an artist sells a gazillion paintings, which Picasso did, Dali did, a lot of these great artists, Matisse, after they were dead, unfortunately, but Picasso did while he was alive. But if you sell a lot, that means people think it's good. Mm -hmm. The artists that don't sell anything, well, they're a fine artist. Total bull crap. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite. Yeah. The people, you know, that buy the art, that appreciate the art, you know, they're the, they're, they're the ones that are the critics. They're the ones that determine whether it's, it's good or bad. Yeah. Well, and some artists create work because they're just driven to create work and they don't necessarily even go out of their way to sell it. So I guess everybody well, has their true. own motivation. And that's definitely. true, but um, artists make art. I mean, we don't think, oh God, this one might sell. Mm -hmm. What you do is you you just pour everything into your art. It's like a good song. I always say a great piece of art, okay, a painting is like, um, Van Morrison when he wrote Brown Eyed Girl. It's it, it's a feeling. And the critic can say whatever he wants, but you can't take that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got another question for you. Tell the critics, when you get to where I am, you'll be where I was. Oh, wow. Oh. Tell me something you used to believe, but you don't anymore. I, I believe people, I believe everything until I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And then when I don't believe it, then I've already moved past it. Yeah. You know, I don't even know if that makes sense, but it's true. Yeah, I understand that. I believe, I want to believe everyone and everything 
until I don't. And I think that's the way to approach life, right? You don't yeah. want to be jaded. No. I, I, I trust people too. I go into every situation. You got to. You got to give everybody the benefit of doubt. I love everybody too. I don't have any prejudice against any race, any um, individual, small, big, baby, grandpa. Love everybody. It's a, it's a good policy because mm -hmm. when you put that out there, it comes back at you a hundredfold. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hawaii taught me that. Whatever you give, whatever you put out there, you know, you create that aloha. Mm -hmm. And that aloha thing is real. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I live in Hawaii. I love the people. I love the aloha spirit. It's all there until you take somebody's wave. Mm. And you get a, a total <laughs> beat down by the hooey guys. <laughs> Sorry, Eddie. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all good. It's all good. Life's good. And again, try to put good out there because that's what you're going to draw towards you. Like I remember I called um, Spencer Johnson, who wrote one of the most prolific art, uh, authors of all time. He wrote One Minute Manager. He wrote Who Moved My Cheese. I don't know if you mm, read that I about changes that in yeah. your life. Yeah. And I think he sold 100 million copies. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I called him. I said, did you hear about this, this book called The Secret? And now there's a video. He goes, come on, Wyland. You and I have been doing this for 35, 40 years. I go, God, mm -hmm. I guess you're right. Mm -hmm. But again, simple. Yeah. Put that out there, what you want. I love the Visualize secret. It changed it my and life. bring that to you. But if you're putting out negative, you're sitting in the basement being a hater, hating people. That's, that's the wrong model. You need to go outside, get a little air, mm -hmm. jump in the ocean, and re rethink what you're doing. You know, bullying people, trying to hurt people. That's the opposite. I always went against the bullies because, yeah. you know, a lot of people, you know, bullied me when I was a kid, single mother. And so it made me stronger and tougher. And then when I see anybody, if I see somebody with disabilities, I'll go over and really hug them and give them a good light or mm -hmm. something. Or if I see a kid that, and my God, when you empower people like that, they never forget it. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, again, be a good human being. Yeah. It's not hard. Love it. Yeah, Love it's it. one of the successes. Of, it's one of the reasons that I've been successful. Good karma, good vibes. You know, walk out, you can look in the mirror and go, man, I did, you know, everything I could today to make the place a little better for somebody else. You know, sometimes it's, it takes a little courage to stand up. It does. Because, you know, the loud negative ones they're they're out there mm. i remember um you know i don't really do my own facebook i actually call you know my assistant and say hey let's do this image mm -hmm. this this photo or something me and my mom and blah 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 but i don't really even have time to look at it because i'm making art but i i one person was on there just saying oh your art's you know, terrible now. He used to be a good artist. It's, you know, and here I am, I'm doing, I think, some of the best stuff I've ever done, you know, based on everything, you know, that I've been doing. And uh, finally, I look at this guy, like, who is this idiot sitting in a basement, you know, you know, being negative. Mm -hmm. And the art is horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crap. So mm -hmm. I said, hey, your art is crap. Why don't you focus <laughs> on that? And Karen says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And the guy got back. He said, Wyland's nice. He would never say anything. This couldn't be Wyland. Oh, it was me, dummy. That's so funny. There. Oh, all right. Sometimes I'm going to give you a fist pump, you, although I, I don't know. I haven't done it since, Karen. I'm cool. Okay, before I let you go, we have a couple yeah, quick things sure. we need to touch on. Right. One of them is, as I understand it, you have just launched a new project, public art project with sculpture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, tell us what that's so, about. So, uh, you know, I majored in sculpture at the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit, College of Art and Design. And uh, so, anyway, what I wanted to do now that I've accomplished my goal of 100, 101 um, public murals, the Wailing Walls, I'm going to do 100, maybe 101. I'll say it here. 101, 101. Uh, monumental sculptures of, of all the uh, endangered and threatened uh, marine life, you know, wow. from the UN. I love it. You know, so animals that really need a little light on them. So I'm going to scale them up. Like I might do a hummingbird that's four stories high. Wow. So when you see it, it makes you look at it differently and ask questions. That's oh, going to be so cool. So 10 of the 100 um, 
uh, you underwater. know, water uh, endangered animals tend to be underwater, so you don't have to snorkel or dive to see them. So I just finished my second one, which is a, a life-size orca, big male breaching, right? And it's um, 25 foot, wow. so it's to scale. And uh, it, it was for this tribes, these tribes in uh, these beautiful tribal leaders and their communities in Alaska. So we just installed it. We had a big ceremony and this is what's great. So they're coming in, all the elders, all the kids who I painted with the years, a couple of years before when I was there at Icy Strait, Alaska. They're all coming in to have a ceremony for this gift. And the orca is their amakua, it's their spirit animal. Ah. So as they're coming in, the orcas are escorting them to the sculpture. Nuh-uh. Oh, yeah. How is that possible? Native tribes, man. Just trust me. Wow. That's how it's possible. That's incredible. I always admired the native people and God, it was so beautiful to dance, the music, and they were so appreciative that I would, you know, give this to their community with uh, Norwegian Bliss, by the way, Frank. Del Rio, the CEO, said, mm -hmm. we were going to give it to the Port of Seattle. And they kept dragging her feet. We'll think about it. And it was done. We mm -hmm. said, well, keep thinking about it. We're going to give this to Alaska. Wow. There you go, guys. There you go. Good stuff, right? Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Listen, this is the beginning for me. We got a long way to go. And so where are we uh, we're have doing it together by? here, right? Uh, I can't tell you. Um, the whole thing about the sculpture project is uh, it's confidential. Mm. other than the basics, because uh, I don't want anybody telling me how to do it. Mm. And they're not free. You got to pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got to donate the land in perpetuity. You got to take care of them. You got to light them. Yeah. So it's a big investment. Yeah. But there are cities that will step up. So there'll be 101 now. Exciting. Cities and communities that will have it. But um, I mean, at the end of the of day, there's no input. No it's one. my input you or go. you don't get it. Yeah. And I'm only doing 101. So mm -hmm. hate hate to bring that news, but that's that's the way it is. There you go. Yeah. Your way or the I don't highway. want anybody watering. It's not even that much. Um, I just don't want to water down my vision because mm -hmm. it's so important. And public art plays such an important role in, in showing people these endangered species, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that they never thought about them. And in mm -hmm. places... You know, you might be driving down the Mississippi or on a boat and you see a, a paddlefish in stainless steel, like, you know, three or four stories high. And it's just going to stop you. And the whaling walls kind of did that mm -hmm. too. You're driving down the highway and you go, is that a blue whale on the side of that building in Long mm -hmm. Beach? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Well, public art is so important. And... We were just talking about it before, about the importance of preserving public art and making sure. I mean, right now you have a, a wall in Detroit that's being in Yeah, danger. yeah. I got to get up at four in the morning and do a live from Detroit uh, Fox 2 News to protect my wall that I painted for my hometown of Detroit. Apparently, uh, and I've done this a few times already, it's the most prominent wall in Detroit. So if you're at Tiger Stadium you know, and somebody hits a home run in the right field. Anyway, it's right there, mm -hmm. right off Woodward. So the latest is um, that this this big billion dollar corporation um, wants to put a piece of another artist, like cover up my wall with another artist and then they're advertising for them. And I said, that's not gonna, so here it is. So I've got to take these people on. So the, the truth of the matter is, if we allow them to take an iconic mural like the one in Detroit, the Wailing Wall, and put advertising over the top of it, they, they, they're saying they're not destroying the art underneath, but they are. It'd be like taking, say, a painting or whatever, a billboard, and putting it over the Statue of Liberty, over the Spirit of Detroit, over, you know, another piece of work and saying, well, we're not destroying the art. It's underneath there. Yeah, you destroy the integrity. Mm -hmm. So it's legal hocus pocus. 
Now, GM tried to do this, and my dad worked for GM, you mm. know, and retired from there. So they put an advertising up over my wall for the All-Star game in, in Detroit because they wanted that advertising. And so I wrote an editorial in the Detroit Free Press, you know, calling it out, saying if they get away with this, then all public art in the U.S. and around the world is exposed. Mm -hmm. So I got to stand up for public art, you know, and, and go after them. And with all the people in Detroit, the pressure was so much, we beat GM. Then Reebok tried it, Nike tried it, and now uh, Rocket Mortgage is trying right now. You're going down, we Rocket. We see you. That's right. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, one one guy. I'm just a little artist from Laguna Beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I got a lot of friends. Yeah. Oh. I got millions of collectors around the world and a billion people a year see my art. So And 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 what you're saying is is important. Well, Public art and is how important. bad is that for a brand to do that? Yeah. Here you are, you're supposed to be a brand for the community and you're going to purposely destroy a landmark mural that people know and love. I went to college there. I was born in Detroit. That was my gift to my home city. Yeah, and they I think it's that. okay to cover it up. And what's funny is they're saying, you better come and get your picture in front of Wyland's Wall downtown Detroit because, you know, it's going to be covered. Brr. Oh, my gosh. These people are supposed to be smart. Well, I wanted to touch on that, too, quickly. Yeah. Um, Laguna Beach, you're, the original Wailing Wall was covered up. Right. And then it has been... Re Resurrected, yeah. How, how did that? Well, the Laguna Wall is a perfect example of um, when I finally got permission after two years from the city of Laguna to paint my first of the 101 walls. Um, the Hotel Laguna, I had to get permission from them. They owned the whole block. And then there was one house that they didn't own, and that was Mr. Curtis, who thought I was a cool guy and said, yeah, of course I want you to paint a whale on this building. So I painted it and all was well until the hotel wanted to buy that property, knock the wall down and put a parking lot there. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they wanted that property, but they were unwilling to pay what it was worth. So the family called me and said, hey, Wyland, we know, you know, our grandfather always joked with you that one day you're going to buy your wall, the mm -hmm. original wall you did. And I said, yeah, I'm interested. And they go, well, the hotel offered us, I think, 400 grand. And I said, wow, it seems low. And they go, yeah. I go, what did it appraise for? And they go, a million. So I wrote them a check for a million bucks. Yay. Yeah. The hotel's not paying attention that I'm doing pretty good. So it was a great investment. Wow. And, but out of spite, they whitewashed over the wall, destroyed it mm -hmm. forever, permanently, wow. completely whitewashed it. So for years, it was a white, ugly wall. And um, and then I built my studio gallery there, but it was a white, ugly wall. And then Mo actually... Um, Mo Hanukkah. Yeah, is, is redoing the Hotel Laguna, and mm -hmm. he's planning to do the whole bluff there. And, and uh, I believe in him. And he came to me and said, hey, do you want to redo your your wall. And I said, are you kidding? I was out there the next day painting <laughs> and I had so much fun and people were cheering. They were driving by beeping. They were coming over to yeah. media, everybody and just said, oh my God, you're bringing the wall back yeah. to Laguna, the original. Yeah. And uh, I did it on canvas on purpose because when I do my art and science museum, I'm going to roll that canvas, you know, and stretch it and put it in my museum yeah. as part of the, yeah. the story. But that, that lower section, um, I'm going to do in porcelain tile. And Mo just agreed to it. That's going to be amazing. And they're going to leave that open space there, which is beautiful. So anyway, it's it's one of the most iconic pieces of public art in yeah. Orange County and inspired so many other, you know, public art pieces. Absolutely. So I'm really proud to have it in Laguna. I, I consider myself a Laguna Beach artist. Yeah. Well. So I'm proud to be a part of that community and... Yeah, it's a lovely town, and uh, there's nothing like Laguna. No. Newport's close. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, Newport's <laughs> cool. But Laguna, there's nothing like it, and yeah. uh, really proud to have my first of uh, my public art projects right there. And now it's going to be done in tile. Oh, my gosh. Come see it. It's going to be beautiful. We're definitely going to come see it. Shamelessly Thank you promoting so much, it. Wyland, for oh, being you're here welcome. and sharing all Thank these great you, dear. stories with us. Yes, you, we'll you are awesome. Great interview you did with everyone else. And Thank you. Yeah, and I 
Loved keep, it. Keep it was the fun. stories coming. Keep it coming. There we go. Sorry about some of the crazy stuff, but that's art. <laughs> that's what art is. And I'm looking back here because her crew, these guys are awesome too. <laughs> anyway, you guys have a great day. Thank Blessed. you. And I'll see you for dinner at the okay. Hotel Laguna. Bam. Hotel Laguna. Thank you for listening to this episode of Delphine Circle. If you enjoyed the episode, please check out our last two. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle.